I feel compelled to say at the outset, after Tony's talk on John Newton and the African slave trade, you could get the wrong impression by looking at this series and the theologians and the authors that somehow good theology is synonymous with whiteness. However, what we find is that the, if, if there's a, a bridge that has to be sturdy to hold weight passing over it, imagine the, the weight that is put upon the, the African-American church of suffering. And you'll find that those supports are really strong. So I've been just thrilled reading lately Lemuel Haynes, the Black Puritan. Some of you won't even know there was such a thing as a Black Puritan. Um, they, he understood the second coming and stressed the second coming more than, than most uh, white preachers I've found. And in seminary class, sometimes uh, beginning preachers, what I find is they'll, they, they love the sense of gospel centrality and will end their sermons by looking at Christ and redemption and they don't go to consummation often. They don't tell the, the complete story and the blessed hope of the second coming. And what I find in Lemuel Haynes and many African American preachers of that day is that they weren't hoping in social structures. This life couldn't be their home. They were looking forward to the blessed hope. So don't get the mistaken impression that somehow whiteness equals good theology. It would be great to do one of these on someone like Lemuel Haynes. But I'm not, I'm doing Lloyd-Jones, and so I would like to pray. Father, we thank you. Oh God, I pray. I pray that as we look at the life of Martin Lloyd-Jones, that we would hear his words to the man who was going to do his funeral sermon. Young man, come here. Don't preach about me. You tell them. You tell them that I'm nothing but a sinner saved by grace. You tell them what a wonder it is to know the Lord Jesus. I'm reminded of how often he said, I did not live for preaching. But the most wonderful thing in the world is to be a Christian and to know Christ and so I pray that we wouldn't merely come to know Martin Lloyd-Jones in this time, but the one to whom he always pointed. We would know you, the one true and living God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, Father, and that you would lift up the Lord Jesus by the power of the Spirit. And would you draw us to him this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes reading only a few sentences can change your life. Something that Pastor John said last night, it's not books often that are life-changing, but sometimes paragraphs or even sentences. And I remember part of the romance of, of reading, doing a deep dive into Lloyd-Jones for five years to read all of his sermons. He never wrote a book. All of his books that are there, 14 volumes on Romans, 8 volumes on Ephesians, all the things that he wrote were sermons and addresses that he gave for different conferences. So reading in Lloyd-Jones over those five years, there was one place that really grabbed hold of me right away. So I remember where I was sitting. I remember the, the blue book, volume three of his exposition of Ephesians. And I was reading the preface. Now, normally you skip the preface to get to the good stuff, but that wasn't the case here. He was talking that he preached the sermons in 1956. And now after his retirement, he had uh, prepared these sermons for publication. So this is published in 1979, two years before his death. 
And this 79-year-old Lloyd-Jones is looking at the church of his day and he's offering a diagnosis. What's wrong with the modern evangelical church? What's wrong? What's the weakness? What's the sickness? What's the disease that we see? What was the church's greatest trouble? Here's what he said, quote, If I were asked to name the greatest trouble among Christians today, including those who are evangelical, I would say that it is our lack of spirituality and of a true knowledge of God. And then he turned and looked at the apostle Paul as the antithesis of this disease. He said, no man had a greater theological and intellectual understanding than the Apostle Paul, but at the same time, no man had a deeper personal and experimental knowledge. It wasn't just doctrine, but it was also life. It was these things coming together. It was what the church of his day was divorcing with doctrine and life and people always criticizing when you try to bring them together. He said, one of the best ways that you know that you're keeping these things together is when you get criticized from both sides. So he said, on the one hand, I'll get criticized as being, oh, you're nothing but uh, an intellectual, always preaching doctrine. And then he said, on the other side, I get people say, oh, you're nothing but a charismatic, always preaching experience. And he said, I'm really happy as long as I'm getting criticized from both because then I know I'm maintaining the balance. And if I stop getting criticized from one side or the other, it's time to examine the very foundations again. Because these things are meant to be together, not light or heat, not doctrine or life, not head or heart. All of these things belong together. And it was his passion in life to not separate those things, but to keep them together. So here's what he says about the church that divorces doctrine and experience. Quote, there is nothing which I know of which is more unscriptural, which is more dangerous to the soul than to divide doctrine from life. There are certain superficial people who say, ah, I cannot be bothered with doctrine. I haven't the time. I'm a busy man. And I have not time to read books and perhaps not even the aptitude. I'm just a practical man. I believe in living the Christian life. Let others who are interested in doctrine be interested. Now there is nothing that every New Testament epistle condemns more than that attitude. Because in the epistles, what does Paul say? What he says is for those that are being joined to prostitutes, for example, Paul can say, what? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? As if if you knew this, you wouldn't be doing this. You can't divorce these things. Don't you know? He said, if doctrine is wrong, your life will be wrong. Doctrine is the direct key for holiness. The content of our doctrine determines the conduct of our life. And so, one of the things that Lloyd-Jones loved was seeing doctrine catch fire in life by the power of the Holy Spirit. The doctrine in life are not oil and water that separate, but fuel and fire, and the explosion is the Christian life. That's what it should be. And so, one of the things that he said is that we don't believe in this either or recipe that the modern church has. That's just a recipe for half-baked living. Why stress head or heart, light or heat, doctrine or life? All head and no heart makes you a stoic egghead. All heart and no head makes someone a squishy, shallow sentimentalist. Why would you want to be any of those? 
So he said, here's what we need. We need a fully baked, both and, head and heart, light and heat, doctrine and life. Now he didn't mean some kind of two-dimensional living like head and heart. He meant the full human experience of head, heart, and will. In fact, he said, the greatest glory of the gospel is that it captures the whole person. Here's what he said. The Christian position is threefold. It is the three together, the three at the same time, and the three always. He's not talking about the Trinity. He's talking about head, heart, and will. A great gospel like this takes up the whole man. And if the whole man is not taken up, then think again as to where you stand. He's looking at Romans six seventeen. Thanks be to God that you became obedient from the heart to that pattern of doctrine to which you were entrusted, you were given. So you see the three there? It says you, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of doctrine. So the doctrine came and from the heart you obeyed it. So he says, what a gospel. What a glorious message. It can satisfy man's mind completely. It can move his heart entirely. And it can lead to wholehearted obedience in the realm of the will. That is the gospel. Christ has died so that we might become complete men. Not parts of us being saved. Not to become lopsided Christians. But that there might be a balanced finality about us. Under the lordship of Christ, this is what the Christian life should look like. And the order is essential. It's doctrine, then life. Here's what he said. In New Testament teaching, we are first of all given the doctrine, given the teaching. Then we are told we have to apply that to our personal circumstances. Obviously, if we don't know the doctrine, we can't apply it. If we lack an understanding of the teaching, we can't put it into operation. First of all, we must have the instruction. We must receive it. We must understand it. Then we say, now in light of this, this is what I have to do. This, he says, is the New Testament doctrine of sanctification. But it's not simply knowing it with the head, grasping it with the heart, and then doing it from the, the will he said, it has to be the Holy Spirit that gives life to this, that causes it to catch fire. Otherwise, we're just like Elijah trying to prepare the, the sacrifice, but needing the fire from heaven to fall upon us, or else there's going to be no life. So, one of the things that I'd like to do that I think is most exciting when you study Lloyd-Jones, is to see what would a life look like that believes this. This is what he said. Your, your conduct is always heralding your doctrine. So if he really believed this, what would it look like to have a life that's fully alive like this, like Michael Reeves talked about with Spurgeon? That's what I want to look at. So here's what the life of Lloyd-Jones looks like. It sounds like something from a Hollywood script, frankly. He gave up fame and fortune to leave a lucrative medical profession in London to go to a very poor area of Wales. Why? Lloyd-Jones, his life, is a canvas upon which God painted the surpassing power of the gospel to save. That's what his life is all about. He never went to seminary. I mean, this is kind of an awkward thing to say in a conference that is coordinated with preview days for Bethlehem College and Seminary. But I think what the Lord was doing was he was taking someone, when the, the picture of the true minister is gone, Ian Murray said, sometimes God likes to pull them from the most unlikely place. And here... There was no more unlikely place than St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. Bart's, as it was called. Ian Murray says it's like a temple to scientific rationalism. 
God pulls Lloyd-Jones out of that, radically saves him, and gives him this belief in the surpassing power of the gospel to save in a time in which liberal theology had just decimated the church. Much like the the downgrade controversy that Spurgeon had to face, that is Lloyd-Jones in his century what Spurgeon was to his. So the way that we structure his life, I put it into five parts, five journeys. He was born in Wales, and then in this first journey, he goes from Wales to London to go to medical school. And then second journey, he goes from London back to Wales to be a preacher. And then the third journey, he goes from Wales back to London to be a pastor at Westminster Chapel in London. And then the fourth journey is London now to the wider world after he retires and speaks more widely and publishes his sermons. And then the fifth journey was the best one, the journey from London to heaven or what he called his special term for heaven, the glory. That's where he wanted to be, the glory. So Martin Lloyd-Jones was born 1899, December 20th in South Wales. His parents, Henry and Margaret, had three boys, Harold, David Martin, and Vincent. Harold was two years older than Martin. Vincent was two years younger. Harold, his older brother, died an untimely death at the age of 20 when the outbreak of Spanish influenza happened in 1918. 20 million people died worldwide. Vincent grew up to be a highly respected court judge. Martin's father, Henry, owned a grocery shop in South Wales, Cardiff. Cardiff was a kind of a cosmopolitan English-speaking town in South Wales, but six years later, Martin's father sold the business and headed back to the heart of southwest Wales to this Welsh-speaking village of Langaitho. And here, there's a remarkable providence because there's a statue for, of Daniel Rowland there. Daniel Rowlands. People say his name differently. He was the, the spark for the, the great West, Welsh revival in the time of the Great Awakening. And so this is going to become a huge part of who Lloyd-Jones is. He would say, even though he talks about the Puritans, that he's not a 17th century man, he's an 18th century man. He believes in the awakenings. That's what he wants, is revival. In fact, he said, when I go to take a vacation, I go take a vacation in the 18th century. That's where I read. That's where I find myself renewed getting way ahead of myself. Martin grew up there, and he had a carefree life, and that went up in flames at the age of 10. Farmers had come to his father's shop to pay their outstanding bills with gold sovereigns on Wednesday evening, January 19th, 1910. They stood talking and smoking in the clothing section of the store. Some tobacco ash obviously had fallen on the fabric, And it lay smoldering and it ignited in the early hours of Thursday morning when everyone was asleep. Martin was rescued by his father who threw him from an upstairs window into the arms of three men standing below. The whole house and the shop went up in flames. And one of the few items retrieved from the fire were these gold sovereigns which were now reduced to a solid mass of gold. Now the fire, of course, was a crushing blow. The family would be faced with these financial losses. It was crushing for a long, long time. The Lloyd-Jones family tried to hide it from their children, their boys, but they were unsuccessful. And one of the things that happened, this is God's frowning providence in Martin's life. Something so significant happened here. These financial troubles suddenly caused Lloyd-Jones to become serious about his studies. Something similar we heard about J.I. Packer. That here, Martin was playing football or soccer in the village square one day, and there was a student assistant who later became a teacher at the school named Edmund Jones, who saw him and he pulled young Martin aside and told him that unless he put his mind to his work and his studies, he would not gain a scholarship to the county secondary school like his brother had done, Harold. Now, Edmund didn't know this, but 
he realized, Lloyd-Jones realized that if I don't get that scholarship, I can't afford school. My, my family will not be able to afford this. He suddenly just woke him up and he devoted himself to his studies. In fact, he earned second place in the scholarship exams of 1911, scoring higher than even his brother Harold had done. But even more devastating than the fire of 1910 was declaring bankruptcy in 1914 in that small town in Wales. They had all of their family ownings auctioned off to the highest bidder. Martin's father left to look for work in Canada for a few months, but nothing materialized. July 1914, Martin's father boarded a ship to look for work in London, and Martin then later joined him when that sh uh, later when the ship reached London on August 3rd. Now, this was a tumultuous time to be in London because this was just when Britain declared war on Germany in World War I. So he's there at this time of, of national crisis. And Martin's father, this dairy business, became very successful. Eventually they were able to pay off their bills and their debts. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones went to St. Mary LeBone Grammar School, January 1915. In his senior examination, he passed all seven subjects and gained distinction in five of them and later applied to St. Bartholomew's Hospital called Bart's in London and was accepted at the unusually young age of 16. Now he was a standout student here. His diagnostic ability especially caught the eye of the instructors. The most distinguished teacher at Bart's, Sir Thomas Horder, was the one that, that noticed him. In fact, he was kind of making the rounds and, and looking at, with the examination at these different patients. And Lloyd-Jones had somehow discovered, had felt an enlarged spleen. I don't even know where a spleen is. And he felt that it was enlarged. And this was something that even Thomas Horder's examination had missed. So he saw so much promise in Lloyd-Jones that he made him his chief clinical assistant. Now, this became the precursor to his conversion. This is amazing. What happened in this temple of scientific rationalism is that he has the, the job, since Horder was the king's physician and would be treating the elites of London, one of Lloyd-Jones' jobs was to catalog all the diseases and illnesses that Horder had addressed in these patients. So here's what happened. In cataloging the kinds of conditions suffered by these dignitaries of the land, like the royal family and cabinet ministers, he began to see that the problems in his day were deeper than medical or intellectual. He diagnosed that the real problem was moral emptiness, spiritual hollowness, he began to see that both the rich and even the poor were being devastated by the same things, by sexual immorality and by drunkenness. And the rich people, most of the time, what was wrong with them, he said, was they just ate or drank too much. And so he began to have this crisis of conscience, like, am I being a doctor to help make people well so they can just go back to their life of sin and sin with more abandon? It began to really trouble him. Ian Murray said, uh, Sir Thomas Horder's card index was almost to him what the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones was for Ezekiel. He began to see the answer can't be medicine. There must be something else. He becomes uh, a medical doctor, uh, a London University MD at the young age of 25. He'd reached the top of his profession as a member of the Royal College of Physicians. But something happens and he begins with wide-eyed wonder in 1923 to listen to the preaching of John Hutton. John Hutton was the minister of Westminster Chapel. There was a spiritual power in this man's preaching that he had never heard before. He'd never experienced this power at any other church. Growing up, what he said about himself was this. For many years, I thought I was a Christian, when in fact I was not. 
It was only later that I came to see that I'd never been a Christian and became one. What I needed was preaching that would convict me of sin, but I never heard this. The preaching we had was always based on the assumption that we were all Christians. In fact, his membership process in his church, they asked him one question to become a member. What was the brook that Jesus and the disciples had to cross before Gethsemane? And he didn't know the answer, and he became a member anyway. That, that was the kind of Bible trivia that they would ask him. And he said that later, this is going to mark his ministry because he had a passion to see the people in the pew be saved. Not to assume everybody's Christian, but to really believe that the gospel needed to completely penetrate the lives of everyone in the pew. And you didn't just assume that you already knew that. So Martin became troubled by the thought that he was now helping people get well only to go back to sinning when he, his own life had been so radically transformed and he began to sense a call to preach. By June of 1926, he was convinced God had called him to be a preacher. June of 1926 was also important because he married the girl, or he proposed to the girl of his dreams, Bethan Phillips, who was also a physician. So in the first two months of 1927, he experienced some of the most stressful things you can go through as a human being. He got married, moved to a new place, and changed jobs. He moved to South Wales to go to this poor area that had been ravaged by drunkenness. And he believed that if he preached the gospel, lives would be changed. And so he starts preaching. At first, there's not a, a huge response to it. The, the church of that day had said, well, how are we going to reach modern man? What we need, we, we need really the, the modern man needs to be reached with modern methods. And maybe if we add more drama and add more modern music. And Lloyd-Jones just stripped all that down and said, we're going back to the New Testament pattern of preaching in the demonstration of the spirit and power. That's the only thing that's going to reach. It's not this kind of time-bound attraction of whatever we have today, more Starbucks or more motocross or whatever in the church. It's the timeless attraction of Christ. That's what we need in the power of the Spirit as you preach the Word. And that's exactly what happened. You get people that were so down and out and, and drunk. And they would come in, these drunkards, and they would listen to the power of the gospel being preached and they would become converted and they didn't know what to do with their alcohol bottles. So they'd come bring them to him and Lloyd-Jones had like a, a bookshelf and a cellar and he didn't know what to do with those. So he just put them all there and it filled up with so many conversions. He was dealing with a day when they were saying, we need to join the temperance movement and all this. And Lloyd-Jones says, you, you can't legislate this. It has to be the gospel changing lives. There was a spiritist medium that saw a crowd going to this church in South Wales and wondered what's going on. And she entered into this Sandfields Chapel at Aberavon. And she said, immediately I was struck by a power that was there. And I was used to sensing power in my work as a, as a medium. But this was different. It was a clean power. And it was more powerful than anything I had ever sensed. And so here she becomes converted. She becomes a believer. You, you had the most radical people like Mark McCann, who was, by his own testimony, he lived for fighting. He had such an anger streak that actually he got so mad at his dog one day that he took out a little knife and cut his dog to pieces. That's the kind of person he was. And as he hears the gospel, he becomes saved and becomes the most gentle, meek, senior saint. Didn't know how to read. Martin's wife, Bethan, helped him would have him over in their living room, teach him to read. And also, religious chapel Welsh schoolgirls like his wife. It's not just the, the, the radical conversion of these people that were living like the world all their life. Like even, even the 
religious that just grow up in church that were like Lloyd-Jones, thinking they were saved. This was the testimony of his wife. Bethan says, I tried to do all a Christian should do in terms of church attendance. I had accepted the Bible as the word of God, but I had no inner peace or joy. I knew nothing of the glorious release of the gospel. I rejoiced to see men and women converted and I even envied them and wished when I saw their radiant faces and changed life that I had been a drunkard or worse so that I too could be converted. I never imagined that I needed to be converted having always been a Christian or that I could get more than I had already. God graciously used Martin's morning sermons to open my eyes and show me my need. So, Some people, Ian Murray would say, I I think this is more of an assurance of salvation that's happening. She believed it was conversion, that it happened there. Now, during this period, there are over 500 people that were converted and joined the church in the 11 years. They, They would keep tabs on membership and they would say, this many joined from the world, meaning they were converted. There's, there's a mini revival that happens at Aberavon, but He begins to see that a door is closing on this ministry. Uh, Lots of things happened to show him this. Actually, there's times he couldn't finish sermons due to vocal error, vocal failure. He later saw it was an error in vocal production. So 1938, 38 years old, he resigned from his church. And the very next weekend when he announced his resignation, he received a letter from Dr. Campbell Morgan, who was the minister at Westminster Chapel in London, to share the preaching there for six months. Lloyd-Jones saw this as God's providence, and in 1938, they moved to London. Well, I could go all day. Let me, let me try to speed this along. In London, Lloyd-Jones begins preaching at Westminster Chapel, April 23rd, 1939, he became the associate pastor. Uh, Remember the first time that he went to London, it was on the eve of World War I. Now we come to World War II. Second World War breaks out September of 1939. During the war, numbers at the chapel went from 2,000 people to 150. Sunday offerings weren't enough in order to to keep these two ministers, Campbell Morgan and Lloyd-Jones, both employed. And so they're wondering, what are we going to do? And in fact, what Lloyd-Jones taught was that the real evidence that you're a Christian is not orthodoxy, because you can have dead orthodoxy, and it's not ethics, because you can have moralism, and it's not experience, because the cults talk a lot about experience too. He said it's this hope of glory. When everything else, every other hope is stripped away, taken away, when the bombs are falling, what do you have? Is all your hope gone or does that one hope that's eternal, does that remain, that hope of glory? And actually this happened while he was preaching. These bombs would be falling. Remember the bombing raids on London and one hit really close to Westminster Chapel and the dust came down and and he was covered while praying and just kept praying. And later, after he was done, the deacon came up and dusted him off, and he just kept preaching. He wasn't shaken by what was happening around him. That's just a picture of his life. He's preaching, it's dwindling to about 150. Now, here's the question. The people at Westminster Chapel are wondering now, okay, what do we do? How are we going to win back people? Do we, maybe we need a bigger choir. Maybe we need more modern things. And Lloyd-Jones again believed, no, the preaching of the gospel is what's going to bring people in, bring them into the kingdom, not just into this chapel. And again, it happened. The first gallery opened back up again, 1948, 1951. The second gallery reopened. And what Lloyd-Jones is just constantly showing is that what we need in every generation is someone that believes in the power of the preached word, in the power of the spirit to do God's work. And that's what he shows again and again. In fact, I have to read something that uh, J.I. Packer said about what it was like to listen to Lloyd-Jones. 
J.I. Packer first heard him when he was a 22-year-old student in London, visited Westminster Chapel in 1948. Here's his description of the first time he heard Martin Lloyd-Jones preach. The preacher was a small man with a big head and evidently thinning hair, wearing a shapeless-looking black gown. His great domed forehead caught the eye at once. He walked briskly to the little pulpit desk in the center of the balcony who said, let us pray in a rather pinched, deep, Welsh-inflected, microphone-magnified voice, and at once began pleading with God to visit us during the service. The blend of reverence and intimacy, adoration and dependence, fluency and simplicity in his praying was remarkable. He had a great gift in prayer. In fact, his wife said, people don't know my husband unless they know him as an evangelist and a man of prayer. That's who he was. Soon he was reading a Bible chapter, Matthew 11, briskly and intelligently rather than dramatically or weightily. And in due course, the auditorium lights went out and he launched into a 45-minute sermon. The sermon was, as we would say nowadays, it blew me away. What was special about it? It was simple, clear, straightforward, man-to-man stuff. It was expository, apologetic, and evangelistic on the grand scale. It was both the planned performance of a magnetic orator and the passionate, compassionate outflow of a man with a message from God that he knew his hearers needed. He worked his way up to a dramatic, growling shout about God's sovereign grace a few minutes before the end. And then from that, he worked down to business-like persuasion, calling on needy souls to come to Christ. It was the old, old story, but it had been made wonderfully new. I went out full of awe and joy with a more vivid sense of the greatness of God in my heart than I had ever known before. That was the legacy of Lloyd-Jones. He left people with more of a sense of God than they ever had before. And sometimes he would say that the, the pulpit is the most romantic place on earth. So sometimes you come into the pulpit and you think it's going to be powerful because of my great preparation. And sometimes it falls flat. One, one lady, a Welsh lady that was in the chapel would say, sometimes there was just this wonderful stillness that would come over us. And it's like you were transported into the text he was talking about. And then other weeks, you said, oh, he was on his own this week. <laughs> It would be perfectly logical and clear exposition, but the same fire and power wouldn't be there. And Lloyd-Jones said, I can't forecast this. Sometimes I come in thinking it's going to be, there's going to be power because of my preparation and there's not. And sometimes I feel like this is going to be terrible. And God just shows up in a remarkable way. He believed in preaching. And the reason for this power, let's not forget is he believed in the apostles' pattern of ministry. That when I'm among you, it's not because I was such a magnetic orator. I'm with you with weakness, fear, trembling. Not exactly what you would teach for public speaking, but with the demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith wouldn't rest on the wisdom of men, but the power of God. That's what Lloyd-Jones taught everywhere. Needing to know doctrine, yes. Needing it to grip the heart and then explode with obedience through the will. But that had to come by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he didn't divorce the Holy Spirit from any area of Christian obedience. I want to say just two more things about him. One of the things that I have most loved about Lloyd-Jones is seeing the things that he taught lived out in his life. I mentioned his marriage, and he had two daughters. Growing up, I had heroes like George Whitfield that I would read about and be just so in awe of, and then I would read about their marriage, and I'd be like, what is happening here? This was a train wreck. And so I wondered, what what about Lloyd-Jones? Wow. 
Let me read to you a love letter that he wrote to his wife during World War II. Bethan, um, the family had been evacuated to the countryside. He stayed behind in London to minister. And she's wondering, well, well, maybe I'll become used to being without you. This is what he says. The idea that I shall become used to being without you is really very funny. I could speak for a long time on this subject. As I've told you many, many times, the passing of the years does nothing but deepen and intensify my love for you. When I think of those days in London in 1925 and 1926, when I thought that no greater love was possible, I could laugh now. Honestly, during this last year, I'd come to believe it was not possible for a man to love his wife more than I loved you. And yet I see now there is no end to love. And it is true that absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I am quite certain that there is no lover anywhere writing to his girl who is quite as mad about her as I am. Indeed, I pity those lovers who aren't married. Well, I better put a curb on things or I shall spend the night writing to you without a word of any news happening here. I mean, what, what this should do is just, if, you, if your spouse is with you, just hug them. Don't take it for granted for a minute. Lloyd-Jones said about marriage, if, if you think that it's all doctrine in Ephesians chapters 1 to 3, and then it's just application in Ephesians chapter 4 through 6, he said, watch this. When Paul deals with marriage, what does he do? Just talk about practicalities? He says, no, suddenly out of nowhere, you get the most elaborate, elongated doctrine of the atonement of Christ found anywhere in Paul's letters devoted to talking about marriage. Because if you don't understand the atonement, and the love of Christ, you can't understand marriage. You're just blown away. Paul opens the door. You think you're done with doctrine? No, you don't understand marriage unless you understand the doctrine of Christ's love for his church. He just lived this out. And in fact, with his grandchildren and children, people wondered, like Jonathan uh, Catherwood, his grandson, people would come up to him and say, oh, what was it like being a, the, the grandson of the doctor? I mean, when you were in his vestry, did you just talk about doctrine? And he said, no, no, he just, he would hide chocolates for us and we would go find them. Or he said, we really loved watching uh, professional wrestling with dad. Like, like I grew up on WWF. I can't imagine Lloyd-Jones watching WWF. And he, here he is watching wrestling and they would say, he would, his whole body would shake when the, when the bad guy would win. He'd, he'd love it. I think secretly he was rooting for the bad guys. This was somebody who knew how to be fully engaged with his wife and kids. Not some far off, distant, academic theologian. He knew what it was like to be fully alive wherever he was. Last part of his journey, he gets really sick. 1981. He gets to the point where he can barely speak, barely walk. In fact, some people would come to encourage him and, and they would become depressed watching him because it would take him so long to get from his couch to his bed. And they would say to him, Martin, how do you do this? You used to be this great preacher. You were a lion in the pulpit and now you're this... It's, it's pathetic to watch you go from your couch to your bed. How, how are you not losing heart? And he, he just quoted in them a Bible verse from Luke 10. Don't rejoice that the demons are subject to your name. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He said, why should I be depressed? I'm no less saved today than I was when I was preaching. In fact, salvation is nearer than when I first believed. He didn't have some identity in ministry, but identity in Christ. That's what he lived for. And so at the end of his life, when he couldn't talk anymore and people were, were reading the Bible to him, they came to 2 Corinthians 4, 
and this great all-surpassing hope of glory that's coming. And, and, and he would point to that text and he would say, that's what I'm looking for. And he would actually, while he could still speak, say, please don't pray for me. Don't hold me back from the glory. That's what he lived for. See the glory of God in Christ. And that's just what I want to leave you with. What was revival to him? One of his revival sermons is preaching on Exodus 33, where Moses, God says to Moses, I'll I'll lead you to the promised land, but I won't go with you. And Moses says, no, show me your ways that I might know you in order to find favor in your sight. If, If your presence doesn't go with us, don't bring us from here. And then Moses said, show me your glory. This is what Lloyd-Jones says. There is nothing so serious as to be without the presence of God. Valuable blessings suddenly had no ultimate value if God isn't with you, if God isn't for you. What is the value of Canaan? What's the value of milk and honey? What's the value of anything? You could call a gift of God without the presence of God. Canaan is no use to us if we don't have you. I want to know him. We can't go on without him. No outward prosperity, no outward success could ever compensate for the absence of God. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world but would forfeit his soul? Do you know God this way? Is he with you? Is he your life? Are you praying and crying out, show me your glory? Take a step nearer. The end of true seeking of revival, the prayer for revival is ultimately for the manifestation of the glory of God to a greater degree than what we have now. Can anybody be satisfied with the way things are now? If you are, it shows you don't really know God himself. Don't have a thirst for God himself. Do you confuse the presence of God with busyness and activity and activism? Have you forgotten this personal element of the presence of God? He's not some agency of blessing. As we advance in faith and knowledge and experience, we will more and more desire God himself. Listen to the Apostle Paul. This is a man who already has so much of Christ. He's met him on the Damascus Road. What does he say, though, in Philippians 3? Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. He doesn't want want to just know the, the facts about the resurrection, but the power of the resurrection, to know him more and more. That was the heartbeat of Lloyd-Jones. And I pray that by the power of the Spirit, that would be your heartbeat here today as well. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this life. And I pray that this heart would be our heart. This gospel would so gloriously capture the totality of who we are, mind, heart, and will. In Jesus' name, amen.